All right, welcome back to the third video in this week's set of videos. So in this video, I'm going to cover the basics of the asset classes we'll become familiar with in this course. There are many different asset classes, and the list you see on the screen is by no means comprehensive, but it does include most of the prominent asset classes. Now this list covers pretty much everything we'll see throughout the course, so let's just go through these things practically one by one. Now the first asset class we have is the money market. And the money market refers to the market for any short-term asset. Uh, in finance, typically we define short-term as one year or less. And as a side note, medium-term is often described as one to five or one to 10 years. And then long-term is typically anything with a maturity beyond 10 years. Uh, but back to my point, any security that matures in a year or less is a money market security. Uh, this includes T-bills, uh, or AKA the short-term debt of the US federal government. Uh, but we also have things like certificates of deposit or CDs. Uh, so CDs, typically they lock up your money for a certain amount of time, but they pay uh, an interest rate that's a little above what you'd get in a savings account. So looking at our current CD rates, right now, potentially you could get 5.15%, uh, 5.2, uh, so here you're locking up at least $500 for a period of one year, and you'd get this annual percentage yield in exchange. And if you, let's say, liquidate your CD or get your cash back before that maturity date, you're typically going to pay a penalty. Next, we have commercial paper. And commercial paper is the short-term debt of what we call blue chip firms. And when I say blue chip, I'm referring to the well-known U.S. firms uh, like Coca-Cola or Apple. These firms, they're profitable, they're unlikely to declare bankruptcy, and so the interest rate they need to pay their creditors uh, to purchase this commercial paper is very, very low. All right, to give you a sense of the yield on commercial paper as of right now, so here we have the commercial paper yields for AA rated and uh, you know uh, non-financial. So this is for non-financial firms and this is for financial firms. And uh, so you can see a little difference here, but right now the current yield on, or the yield on this commercial paper, about 5.32%, 5.31%. It's a little higher for single A rated, uh, but you get the sense here of, you know, this is just slightly above the, the yield that you get on a CD. Now, the one final thing I should point out with respect to commercial paper is that it has a maturity of 270 days or less. So this is the short-term debt of a company. You cannot have maturity of more than 270 days with commercial paper. All right, next we have money market mutual funds. And money market mutual funds, these are basically mutual funds that pool assets that have a maturity of a year or less. So let's take a look at one example of a money market mutual fund. So the VMMXX, the Vanguard Cash Reserves Federal Money Market Fund. So here we have a classic money market mutual fund. It's got an expense ratio of 16 bips or 16 basis points. It typically is going to have a lower return than your average mutual fund because these assets are very, very liquid. And we can actually see what's in this mutual fund. So right now it's comprised of 23% US T-bills, so short-term US government debt. Other US, this is probably agency debt, maybe it's uh, state level debt, etc. And then repos, which we'll talk about in a second. All right, now repos, this is these are basically short-term agreements to either sell a security right now and then buy it back at a higher price or you can do a reverse repo which is literally just the opposite of that buy something uh some asset and then sell it back at a later date so let's go ahead and take a look at what these repos actually do basically a repo is an agreement to give up some collateral in exchange for a short-term loan uh, so it's it's a lot like a collateralized loan. Uh, the maturity on these is typically, uh, technically it can be greater than one year, but we typically think of these repos as short-term 
or money market securities. Uh, the most common asset used in a repo is going to be some government security. So let's see how these things work. Let's say that you have some need to have some level of cap some capital ratio. You need to maintain some capital ratio and basically you need cash. Well, what you could do is if you need to borrow cash, let's say you're the borrower here, you borrow a hundred dollars in cash in exchange you put up $150 in collateral assets. So these are assets that you or your company own. And if you default in paying back this $100 in cash, uh, your lender has the right to collect on up to $150 in that collateral. Now, that's day one. When you no longer need this cash, that's when you have the buyback period. Let's say that's day two. So same two parties, you're still the borrower. On day two, you pay $101 in cash, so it's the principal plus some, say, a dollar in interest, and then that $150 in collateral assets no longer becomes collateral. You, you, know, you don't have to worry about it being seized in the case that you default on this repo. So that's how a repo works. Okay, now let's talk a little more about government debt. Uh, the most liquid government debt in the U.S. is going to be T-bills. So T-bills, uh, I, I guess I should say they're one of the most liquid assets in the world today. There's trillions of do dollars of these trading right now. Uh, typically, when we say T-bills, we're talking about the short-term issuances of the U.S. federal government. And this is used by the government to raise money for national defense, Medicare, Medicaid, and all the discretionary spending over the course of the year. Now, T-bills, they come with a large number of maturities. So we have, say, the 4-week, the 8-week, the 13-week, 26, 52-week. Uh, these correspond to the 1-month, 2-months, 3-months, 6-months, and 1-year T-bills. Uh, now, T-bills, they typically are going to have a very low interest rate, and that's because they're backed by the faith of in the, faith in the U.S. government. So these have never been defaulted on. Typically, we say that T-bills are risk-free. There's no risk that the government is going to default on these debt obligations. So when we get to modeling, we're going to use T-bills or some other treasury issuance as our risk-free rate. Uh, there are a lot of other characteristics of these. One notable one is that these are uh, any uh, anything that you earn here, any uh, capital gains you get uh, is exempt from state and local taxes. Uh, now, in addition to T-bills, which are short-term, we can also have T-notes, which are medium-term, so 1 to 10-year maturity, and then T-bonds, which are the long-term debt, so 10 years plus maturity. And unlike T-bills, which don't pay coupons, T-notes and T-bonds will typically pay some coupons every six months. Uh, so that's a, a key difference here. Uh, easy exam question, which of the following does not pay coupon payments? Well, of these three, it'd be a T-bill. Now, I do have two final points to make on the money market. Uh, the first one is that there is a big benefit to the money market in that the assets are extremely liquid. You can buy and sell them very close to what their actual fair value is. And the reason for this is that there's many investors who are willing to buy and sell these assets. However, because these assets are very liquid, there's less risk of them being defaulted on. And typically that means that there's a lower yield being assigned to them. So you don't make a lot of money investing in the money market. Uh, so low levels of return, that's a big characteristic of money market securities. Uh, now, the second point I want to make is that most securities in the money market are sold on a discount basis. So if you remember the T-bill I just mentioned, and uh, I said that it doesn't pay coupons, uh, basically most of these assets, like T-bills, are going to sell at a discount to the face value. So T-bills, they might have a face value of $100, and they'll trade at something like $99. So you buy this for $99, and then at maturity, you get the face value of $100. So because the current price is below the face value, we say that this is sold at a discount or on a discount basis. All right. 
Now, as we get away from the money market, there's a couple things that you should know. And, you know, the first thing that I should make you aware of is the SOFR or secured overnight financing rate. Uh, now, in the last couple of years, we've seen uh, the, the rise of the SOFR and other metrics like SOFR. So I think it's important to talk about exactly what this is. Uh, just a, a bit of history. Back in the day, you know, prior to like five or 10 years ago, the base rate in a lot of adjustable rate loans used to be something called LIBOR. I don't even touch on LIBOR nowadays because it's, it, it's not being used as the base rate in adjustable rate loans or mortgages. Uh, nowadays, we use SOFR. And we use SOFR because, quite frankly, it's a good rate that we can say or we can use as our base rate in adjustable rate loans. If we need to set the interest rate on an adjustable rate loan or a mortgage, SOFR gives us the base rate that we can generally trust. It's measured as uh, the cost of borrowing cash overnight when that cash is collateralized by treasury securities. Uh, unlike the old LIBOR, SOFR, it's data-driven. LIBOR used to be based on surveys, so it could be manipulated, which is why it was done away with. So SOFR, uh, you can get a sense of what this rate is. Right now, as of the time of recording, that rate is 5.32%. So if you are looking for an adjustable rate mortgage, your interest rate is typically going to be, well, whatever your SOFR rate is, plus some premium on top of that. It might be SOFR plus 1% or SOFR plus 2% or something like that. So SOFR in the investment community, in the loan community, uh, this is a very important rate because it's, it's our base rate. It's becoming more popular as our base rate in a lot of short-term and long-term loans. All right, so that's basically it on SOFR. It's unlike LIBOR, which was survey-based, SOFR is transaction-based. Now, the next asset class that we have is the fixed income securities, or we could call this the, the long-term debt asset class. And when we talk about fixed income securities, these are just investments that offer a periodic cash payment. Uh, typically, this payment is going to be fixed in dollar terms, or it may vary according to some predetermined formula. Maybe the, the payment is based on SOFR or something like that. Uh, so the most common or the most well-known assets in this asset class are going to be bonds, so the long-term debt inst instruments. Uh, we have a couple other names for these, uh, but we'll, we'll stick with bonds for right now. We can also have convertible debt. And convertible debt, this is just debt issuances that can be converted at some later date into another asset, like equity. So convertible debt very often is going to be able to be converted into equity at a set conversion ratio. Uh, so you'll know that ahead of time when the, the debt is created. And there's a lot of reasons why you would want to convert this debt into equity. Maybe the equity has appreciated in value, and you, if you convert that debt into shares of equity, uh, the value of your security has increased tremendously. The next asset we have in this asset class is preferred stock. And preferred stock is kind of like a hybrid between debt and equity. Uh, it's it's kind of like a perpetuity it, that pays out a fixed dividend. Uh, so this fixed dividend Typically, you can't, uh, this is going to be paid at any time point. Uh, it's going to be you know, either quarterly or semi-annually. If the firm wants to suspend the dividend, there are consequences to doing so. Uh, so very often, this, this preferred stock, it just continues to pay off a dividend. Uh, one thing to note about preferred stock is that it doesn't come with voting rights. If you own this preferred stock, Unlike common stock, which we'll talk about later, this does not come with the ability to vote on big decisions at the firm. Next, we have MBSs, or mortgage-backed securities. And these are essentially prepackaged mortgages with a certain credit quality. I'll go into more detail on these, as well as asset-backed securities in a few seconds. Uh, but basically, these MBSs or ABSs, these are just a portfolio that represents a large number of mortgages or some other asset like uh, auto loans. And basically you're, you're betting on the, the entire portfolio. These are like uh, an investment in a portfolio of loans. Okay, so how do these work? Well, typically you're gonna have some lenders issuing mortgages. 
uh, to many borrowers. We're just talking about mortgage-backed securities here, not asset-backed securities. So with mortgage-backed securities, uh, these mortgages are hopefully going to be similar in some way, similar in maturity, similar in riskiness of the borrower, similar in the type of home, maybe like a three-bedroom, two-bath, uh, and then hopefully similar in terms of location, say like uh, three-bedroom homes in the Midwest to uh, individuals with a FICO score between, I don't know, 600 and 700 or something. Now, once those mortgages are issued, they're going to be bundled together into this pool. Now, this pool could represent a 1,000 mortgages or 10,000 mortgages, and ultimately, this is going to represent a huge amount of money, let's say a billion dollars. Once those mortgages are pooled together, they're going to be broken down into small amounts and sold as this new security. So basically, these are going to be what we call securitized. So this billion-dollar pool, it could be broken down into a 1,000 shares, each worth a million dollars. So if you own one share of this pool, you own essentially a, a cross-section of this pool. Uh, now, the price that you're going to pay for this, this MBS is going to depend on the perceived riskiness of the underlying assets. So let's take a look at this in a, a little more proper way. So let's say you have five mortgages. We know some characteristics about each mortgage. So this one's a 15-year issued to a person with a 700 FICO score. This one's a 30-year, 15, 30, 30. They all have... Well, a couple of these are fairly similar FICO scores, and you have some people who have really low FICO scores. What you're going to do to create the MBS is you're going to pool these mortgages together, and you're going to create the new MBS. And then you're going to go out and find organizations like Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, JP Morgan, who are willing to buy a certain percentage or a certain number of these MBSs. So Lehman might buy 40% or they, they would have bought 40%. Bear might buy 30%, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the idea here is that you're diversifying the risk. You're, you know, everyone's exposed to default of mortgage two, but if mortgager, or, you know, the, the borrower for this mortgage defaults, it represents a small portion of the overall portfolio. So you're diversifying the the risk. And this is why these things for a long time have been seen a lot less risky than a lot of other assets. Uh, ultimately, one of the big contributors to Lehman Brothers defaulting was that they had a huge amount of MBSs on their books. And it was unclear what was in these MBSs, you know, what type of mortgages these were, who the borrowers were. And ultimately, uh, Lehman overpaid for these, the value of the underlying assets was not nearly as valuable and the value of the MBSs fell and Lehman declared bankruptcy. Okay, now bonds come in many different shapes and sizes. Uh, so generally these are fixed income investments in which one party loans money to another party and the other party is going to pay a certain you know, variable or fixed interest rate. There are a lot of different bonds out there, things like T-notes, T-bonds. Uh, we have things like TIPS, which pay basically whatever the inflation rate is or the you know, whatever the CPI is in the U.S. Federal agencies will also, also issue debt, so you can buy the, the debt of U.S. federal agencies. Municipal bonds are bonds issued by local, so think your, your county, your city, or even your state. So municipal bonds, uh, they... Uh, there's some characteristics here that you should know about international bonds you can buy and then corporate bonds. So a large number of firms will issue bonds or long-term debt. And if you are a big enough investor, you could buy bonds issued by these companies. All right. So getting away from the long-term debt market, we also have common equity and common equity as an asset class. It comes with a couple of key characteristics. Uh, first off, it represents an ownership stake in the business. The more shares you own, the larger your percentage of ownership in the firm. Next, this stock also represents a limited liability. Uh, so basically, if you are the owner of, let's say, a C-Corp, if the firm, let's say, commits some crime and you're, you just own the shares, you're not a manager or anything, the most you can lose 
is the amount that you put in. There's limited liability from any kind of crime that was committed uh, by the firm, like Boeing. Other characteristics you should know about common equity, there's a residual claim. In the case that, let's say, the, fun the company declares bankruptcy, typically you are at the back of the line to receive anything left from the assets of the firm. Typically, your secured bondholders are going to get uh, what they're owed, then your unsecured bondholders, and then a lot of other players are going to get what they're owed. And then finally, if there's any assets left in the case of the mortgage, the bankruptcy, you get what, you get what's left. Uh, so typically you're getting pennies on the dollar if the company whose equity you own declares bankruptcy. Uh, next, a lot of equities or common shares will pay off, pay dividends. Uh, though the more common thing nowadays is to repurchase shares. So a lot more companies are starting to repurchase shares as needed. And so there's there's some benefits. These are the big benefits of being a, a common equity holder. You get potentially dividends. You could have your shares repurchased. Or, you know, you could see capital gains if you hold your shares. Uh, now, there are other things you should know about common equity. A lot of firms will typically only have one class of stock. So think, oh, I don't know, I think Apple has a single share class, meaning that every share of stock represents the same voting rights. But there are companies out there like Berkshire Hathaway or Google that have dual class shares. So Berkshire, we'll see this in class, but Berkshire's shares are incredibly expensive. As of right now, I think they're worth about half a million per share, the class A shares are. But they also have a class B share. Uh, that basically entitles you to a fraction of the ownership that the Class A shares do. Google has dual class shares. Meta has dual class shares. It's how Mark Zuckerberg can own a minority of the shares outstanding, but still contain, uh, still maintain greater voting rights and influence the company. Uh, so, and that brings me to voting rights. So typically we say that common equity comes with voting rights. That's not always the case, but typically it should be. So the more shares you own, the more voting rights you have in the firm's annual meeting or in any big event, like whether the firm should be acquired by uh, a potential acquirer. Okay, so I mentioned bankruptcy a few seconds ago, and I thought I should do it justice, but I think it's important to talk about the hierarchy the hierarchy with respect to bankruptcy. Uh, so typically, who gets paid in order? Well, the firm is going to pay its bankruptcy costs first. So maybe there's some costs to the court that need to be paid. So those are going to get paid first. Then if any creditors, any bondholders have secured debt, they're going to be able to claim whatever assets that their bonds are secured by. So they get to own, uh, to acquire those. Any unsecured creditors, they're next in line, so they get a portion of the assets that remain. And then finally, at the very bottom are going to be your shareholders, which, like I said, will get pennies, if anything at all. Uh, so this is what happens in the case of a Chapter 7 bankruptcy in the United States, liquidation. All right, the next asset class we need to talk about is managed funds. Uh, now, this asset class consists of more than what I have listed here, but... Uh, these are some of the most important managed funds in the industry. Mutual funds, hedge funds, ETFs. Now, a mutual fund is a heavily regulated portfolio managed by a professional. It pools the cash provided by investors and invests in typically stocks and or bonds. Mutual funds are required to report their holdings at the end of every quarter. And mutual funds are often expected to have active management. Now, this is a little different than ETFs otherwise known as exchange-traded funds. ETFs, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, typically ETFs are going to track a basket of goods, uh, like the S&P 500, uh, so the 500 stocks in the S&P 500, or the 30 stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, the key difference here between mutual funds and ETFs is that most mutual funds are going to be actively managed, and most ETFs are going to be passively managed. Now, uh, the third type of managed fund I have here are hedge funds. And hedge funds are absolutely actively managed. Uh, whereas mutual funds, though, are heavily regulated and usually restricted to holding stocks and bonds, hedge funds are allowed to take on almost any trading strategy they want. 
they they can invest in some crazy asset classes. And they also don't have to report their, their holdings publicly like mutual funds do. Uh, now, a consequence of this is that some hedge funds, uh, they're going to be a lot more risky than your average mutual fund. Uh, so they'll buy bonds of firms or countries that have defaulted on their debt, or maybe they'll take the majority stake in a firm and try to turn around the firm uh, by taking control of management. Uh, there's a lot of crazy risky strategies that hedge funds will engage in. And so this this is why any investor in a hedge fund typically has to be an accredited investor. Uh, typically, we say that an accredited investor is a high net worth investor. Uh, right now, the, the definition of who qualifies is typically if you're a single investor, you have to make more than, I believe, $250,000 in two consecutive years. If you're filing jointly, you and your spouse have to make more than $300,000. Uh, or you could have a net worth of more than a million dollars. That's what counts as an accredited investor, and it's what you need to be an investor in a hedge fund. Uh, if you're wondering what does a hedge fund look like, well, there's all kinds of hedge funds that have made the news in the last couple of years. If you remember Martin Shkreli uh, or the Pharma Bro, uh, this is the guy that ran the hedge fund that purchased a pharmaceutical firm that, per that produced uh, treatments for malaria. Uh, so he purchased this company and then raised the price of the drug by 5,000%. Uh, this is one of a thousand techniques employed by hedge funds. Uh, these funds, I typically, I've, I've always considered them the wild west of portfolio management. They can take on strategies that almost no other fund can. All right, so we've talked about a bunch of different types of funds. Uh, let's talk about their styles. So there's two broad styles of investment management. We have passive management and active management. But passive management, when we talk about that, uh, typically we're saying that the fund manager is not attempting to buy or sell stocks uh, to time the market. They're not trying to identify undervalued or overvalued securities. Rather, they're simply trying to hold the same bundle of assets through time. Uh, the only time a passively managed fund is going to change its portfolio is when uh, the assets uh, leave the bundle. So for example, if an ETF is passively managed and it tracks the S&P 500 index, the only time it's going to buy and sell securities is when new investors or investors buy more shares of the ETF or they pull their money out or the composition of the underlying index changes. So a stock is dropped off the index and then that's when this passively managed ETF will sell its shares in that stock. Now, actively managed funds typically, I mean, these are what you think of when you think of funds trying to time the market, trying to identify undervalued or overvalued securities. If you're managing a fund and trying to pick winners and sell losers, you're engaging in active management. Uh, if you guys take portfolio management, which is the class after this one, uh, you are going to be engaging in active management because we have a student managed investment fund that manages about eh, $2.5 million ish. Uh, so I teach that class. So, you know, you'll get some hands on experience with that. All right. The next asset class we have are derivatives. And when we talk about derivatives, the whole meaning behind this name is that their value is derived from some underlying asset like a commodity or a bond or a stock. Basically, derivatives, the value is derived from some underlying asset. And we have two broad types of derivatives. We have options and then we have futures. Uh, there's some other derivatives out there, but these are the two broad classes, I'd say, uh, parts of this asset class. Uh, now, options... There's two specific types of options I want to highlight, two things that you should absolutely know week one in any investments class, call options and put options. Now your call options, these give you the right to buy an underlying asset at an agreed upon price called a strike price. Uh, typically you buy call options if you expect the underlying assets value to increase because this option will allow you to buy this underlying asset at a lower strike price than the current price. So you can profit as the value of the underlying asset appreciates. 
Put options work the exact opposite way. So they give you the right to sell an underlying asset at an agreed upon strike price. Now, put options are really good if you want to bet against some underlying asset like, oh, a stock or an ETF or something like that. Or let's say that you want to hedge against downside risk. Uh, you can buy put options on some assets that you own. Uh, in the case that the value of those underlying assets fall, uh, the put options can be exercised and they allow you to sell that underlying asset for whatever the strike price is. So, you know, you get to sell for higher than you otherwise would. Now, the other broad type of derivative, I would say, are futures contracts. And there's some other things out there like future, uh, forwards and swaps, but we'll focus on futures. Uh, basically, a futures contract is an agreement where you, uh, you make it today and that agreement is going to detail uh, the delivery of an asset in the future at a specified date uh, for an agreed upon price called the futures price. Now, futures allow you to lock in the amount that you get to sell an asset for in the future, and this essentially reduces risk. If you want to lock in the amount that you get to sell your corn for as a farmer, well, this is a great way to do it because you can say, I'm going to sell my corn for, I don't know, seven, eight dollars a bushel, for example. If the price of corn is lower than that at the futures date, let's say six months from now, you still get to sell your corn for eight dollars a bushel. Uh, so it's a great way to reduce risk. Now, there are some other investments out there, uh, tax advantage investments uh, like municipal bonds. Uh, we'll talk about those a little later, but uh, basically, tax advantage investments, there's a couple of these throughout the area of investments. Basically, these allow you to pay higher after-tax returns by reducing the amount of tax you have to pay on any capital gains or income. Uh, there's other asset classes out there too, like real estate. So real estate, you know, the, the residential or the commercial or the uh, industrial property markets, uh, typically this is, we say this is an asset class all by itself. And then you can also have asset classes like the tangibles. So uh, things like commodities or, you know, say like gold or collectibles or something like that. All right, so let's try a CFA question uh, just to make sure we're all caught up. Which of the following is least likely to be a pooled investment vehicle? A, asset-backed securities, B, convertible debt, or C, hedge funds? Well, the correct answer is going to be convertible debt. Uh, these other two, A and C, these are, are very classic pooled investment vehicles. Uh, Asset-backed securities, basically you're, you're pooling a bunch of different, let's say, auto loans or something like that together, and then you're selling off securities that represent a percentage of the, that pool. Hedge funds, you're pooling a bunch of investors' money together and managing it. Uh, Convertible debt, basically you can buy one debt issuance or your, or one uh, bond, one convertible bond. That, that's pretty easy. So cor correct answer here, B. Okay, so let's summarize. There are many asset classes out there and there's a lot of stylized facts you should know about each of them. Uh, so for example, which of these asset classes is the most liquid? Well, the money market is very, very liquid. I would say it's one of the most liquid asset classes uh, but you should know some stylized facts about each of these different asset classes. Uh, we also talked about common stock and bonds. Common stock represents an ownership stake in a firm, uh, whereas bonds do not. And then all managed funds are typically going to pool assets of investors to create a portfolio uh, that is managed by, say, some investment manager. Okay, so that's that, and I'm going to end here. But if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much.